The downtown Chicago campus of Northwestern University is largely devoted to medical education, clinical treatments, and research for cures. Now in its fourth decade, the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center has its home base in the Lurie Research Building. Both were made possible by the generosity and foresight of Bob and his family. There are about 50 comprehensive cancer centers in the country, and we are part of the elite group of comprehensive cancer centers, the NCCN. These are the centers that are really strong and put together the guidelines for the treatment of cancer, not only in the U.S., but everywhere in the world. Comprehensive cancer means that the cancer center is strong in all areas that they need for that, and that is uh, clinical care. It has to be superb, clinical research, clinical trials, basic science, population sciences, uh, like prevention and control, and also community outreach and engagement. What impact does the cancer center have in the community, in our catchment area, as we call it, the immediate area that we serve? If you come to a comprehensive cancer center, you have access to the latest, to the newest, to the best uh, the ther uh, therapies, treatments that were developed from research. Basic research is really the goal is to figure out how stuff works. So if we don't understand how things work, for instance, how cells divide, how cells communicate with each other, how they move, then we can't understand how cancer starts, how cancer cells grow, how they escape their environment. So we have to understand how things work first. It started here, it started in a bench with people asking very simple questions about how molecules work, how cells work, and then testing it across a number of models to make sure it's safe for the patients to receive that care. Without the funding, we would not be where we are in prostate cancer, but we certainly would not be where we are with breast cancer, with lung cancer, with any cancer for that matter, or hematologic malignancy. So discovery and research is really what will cure cancer. One advantage that we have here, we have invested a lot of resources, is try to accelerate translation from the lab to the clinic. That's probably the most difficult thing a cancer center can do. We are doing research in multidisciplinary approaches to many of these cancers, so that means collaborating with our surgeons and our interventional radiologists, our transplant surgeons, and a number of different people to, uh, to cure uh, metastatic colon cancer. We're doing research on new agents, new drugs in development for pancreas cancer, a very unmet need at this time. We have at least two different projects that have developed here at Northwestern new therapies that are totally new for prostate cancer that are now advancing to the preclinical stage to be put into patients very soon. For years and decades, literally, from the days I started in my training, prostate cancer was never on the radar screen, generally speaking. Over the past 30 years, there's been really tremendous progress in the therapeutics and the biology understanding in the prevention space research in all kinds of ways. When I entered the field, patients who had resistant prostate cancer on average lived nine months. Now they are living multiple years. When you see what the Cancer Center has done, now one of the premier centers in the country, uh, that's because we've coupled outstanding research as engineering and chemistry feed into the cancer mission, but also bringing that to patient care, making Northwestern a place where patients with not very many good options have a shot at a treatment that can really work. What is most unique here and unexpected is the major strength we have as a university. We have a very strong clinical network and hospital and all that stuff. And how we have been able to bring them to the clinic or how we do things back and forth, that's unusual here. It's very collaborative and I think that's one of the strengths of the Cancer Center. 
So we have collaborations among many different departments, many different divisions within the departments. For instance, the Department of Medicine has a number of divisions, all of whom have members in the Cancer Center. And we also have a lot of collaborations with people on the Evanston campus, the chemists, the engineers, people who work in materials, people who are creating these nanotechnology-driven new therapeutics. To me, what's so special about Northwestern and the Cancer Center in particular uh, is it has built this incredible bullpen of talent that is attracted from all parts of the world to really focus their energies on creating new capabilities in both the diagnostic and therapeutic space. Most universities tend to create silos, uh, silos of talent. Uh, Northwestern uh, broke down almost all barriers uh, and really embraced this idea of one Northwestern. And what that meant was that scientists and engineers and medical doctors could freely collaborate. In fact, it was strongly encouraged to bring each other's talents to begin to solve problems that nobody could solve alone. Nanotechnology is playing a huge synergistic role with what we're trying to accomplish at the Cancer Center. We had the first uh, clinical trial uh, of uh, nanoparticles for brain tumors. We took the science of Chad Mirkin and we translated took it to the clinic, and that was a significant development. The Merkin lab has developed particles that have the remarkable ability to cross the blood-brain barrier and enter the brain, which makes them an exciting candidate for treating glioblastoma and other brain cancers. The problem with brain tumors is that because of the blood-brain barrier, things don't get easily in the brain. So drugs are more difficult to get in the brain, and there are things like this that we try to do. We did the first clinical trial of those particles here at Northwestern a few years ago uh, with exciting results, and we're really now investing a lot more in advancing these revolutionary therapies. And those drugs are, are in clinical trials. They're in humans now, uh, which is really exciting. So we, we always knew that there, uh, this was coming to some extent. We didn't know how long it was going to take. Uh, but we're now really in the thick of it. And it's exciting to be here at Northwestern to really develop these types of tools and work with a lot of the world-class medical folks to see how we can get them into patients more quickly. The metabolism of the cancer cells and the metabolism of the immune cells are things that one, you know, that we work around. There is a field called immunometabolism trying to use these approaches to, to optimize the immune system to attack cancer. I work on metabolism. Uh, I think most people would agree that uh, cancer is your, something about a particular cell in your body. Um, the genetics got rewired. Rewired where a cell that shouldn't proliferate just proliferates like crazy and it can survive like crazy. And it doesn't care about the rest of the, its neighbors, right? Right now your heart and your liver and your brain are all in a perfect homeostasis. They all care about each other, right? You get a cancer somewhere, it doesn't care. It's like, I'm gonna take all the resources, I'm just gonna grow like crazy. So we're putting in therapies like immunotherapy, radiotherapy, and figuring out how those therapies rewire metabolism and the idea would be if you give immunotherapy, is there something in metabolism we can target to boost this? And the thing that we're targeting, normal cells don't care about. Even cancer doesn't care about it. It only cares when you have immunotherapy. Another area that I would like to emphasize is tumor immunotherapy. The cancer cells send signals to the immune system to blind it. So the immune system cannot see the cancer cells, and the cancer cells hide and grow. Sort of like a wolf in sheep's clothing kind of thing. So the tumor devises ways of disguising itself from the immune system, and so part of what people who are doing tumor immunotherapy are doing is figuring out ways of getting the tumor to take off its sheep's clothing. One of the big breakthroughs that happened recently is where we're using immunotherapy to treat a very particular subset of rectal cancer. The standard of care treatment for rectal cancer is chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, often needing a diverting colostomy. And recent data has shown that using immunotherapy instead of all of that might actually have the potential to cure the disease. So the next five years is gonna be really exciting. 
you can develop vaccines for cancer. Oftentimes when people develop vaccines, they basically take uh, mixtures of two things, uh, something we call an adjuvant that stimulates the immune system, so revs it up, uh, and something called an antigen, typically a, a small protein or, or peptide that trains your immune system to only find cancer cells and to kill those. And that's re the really exciting thing about immunotherapy. You're no longer talking about poisoning effectively with chemotherapy. You're talking about using one's immune system to selectively fight different forms of the disease. But there's an even more exciting thing coming, and that is that when you take particles and put these different components together and present them in different formats in different ways, you can dramatically increase the efficacy of these types of vaccines. The idea that you can design vaccines not just based upon the components, but based upon the structural presentations of them, so that they interact with your body in a way to maximize how they stimulate the immune system and to train it very, very selectively to create potent effects, curative in certain cases. And, and that's really exciting. And I think you're going to see one drug after another developed on that principle. What you see in the news and what you see all the time that's splashed around is all of these great breakthroughs. These great breakthroughs are fantastic. They don't always apply to everybody. They're often for very particular subsets of patients. So while we're working towards these breakthroughs, I think it's really important that we need to take care of everybody else. We're not just doing the basic research. That's incredibly important. It's absolutely essential, but we're also interacting with people in our communities to understand what their needs are. As basic scientists, we're beginning to do that more and more. Everyone on the team is really important, and it is absolutely a team sport to do this type of work to address cancer health inequities and to really meet the needs of everyone in the community. Whether it be food insecurity, housing instability, needing help, trying to find a, a job. I mean, those are all things that many of us take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis because we're resourced. But for many of our populations that experience inequities in cancer, there are a lot of barriers to care. And having a patient navigator as part of that care team is really critical to getting them through uh, cancer screening, follow-up, and treatment. What we have realized is that many times, uh, especially with trials and, and new therapies, some communities don't get the benefit of those uh, trials and treatments. And one of the fundamental problems is that we don't have a diverse workforce. So the thinking is that if you have a diverse workforce, it's much more comfortable, much easier for a diverse patient population to get the benefit. So again, the National Cancer Institute is really leading the charge on this to help all the cancer centers to have a more diverse workforce. Once we acknowledge that and, and understand that we check our biases at the door every time we have a patient clinical encounter, every time that we go out and create a community-centered program and a community-driven program, then we can move forward together. And, and really the attitude of we walk with you is really important. I walk with every single patient that I see. I walk with every single community organization that I work with. And that is how the we works here at Lurie Cancer Center. Philanthropy makes such an incredible difference in the fight against cancer because that's where the new treatments come from. They come from philanthropy because that's where you can go for the big idea uh, and take your risk because the donor wants you to do this. They want you to do something uh, dramatic, right? And you cannot do that with federal funding. Federal funding, you have to go through the process, apply, and, and be more conservative. Otherwise, you will not get the funding. Philanthropy is what, you know, has helped cure cancers and will keep helping in the future and making a difference. These things don't happen just suddenly. This starts from work that's done by scientists and collaborations. The purpose of fundraising is not to have money, but it's also to have the money so that we can invest it uh, in finding the new cures. So a lot of us, a lot of investigators, have very good ideas. Sometimes you need some funding to do that one experiment, you know, which is usually expensive, to really tell you if the idea has legs. We really need to seed these innovative ideas early on. Each of the philanthropic do dollars actually 
uh, gives a return on investment of about 10 to 1. Every dollar gives rise to $10 from NIH. Normally, the funding agents prefer to put their money more safe projects. They are accountable to the taxpayer, to Congress, so they can't afford really risky uh, uh, bats. And I think that's where philanthropy makes a world of difference. It makes a high-hanging fruit become a low-hanging fruit and enable us then to capture public investment to develop the therapies further. When you get a little bit of a boost with unrestricted funding, your imagination gets fired up. You need shots on goal. And, and we get shots on goal from money from the NCI. We get shots on goal uh, from philanthropic donations. And we often can take much greater risk and, and look at some of the things that might sound a little bit crazy, but could really have the greatest impact uh, with the philanthropic uh, sources of, of financing. These gifts that we get that enable so much really could open the next door to something that really is revolutionary. There are two things that objectively matter. One is new drugs, because there are many drugs that have cured people. So if we come up with new basic mechanisms and develop drugs based on that, we have a shot to cure groups of people. And the second one is the immune system. If we find a way to modulate the immune system to kill cancers without causing major side effects, then, uh, you know, that will be a big deal too. We will unambiguously cure certain forms of cancer. Um, th that is coming. Uh, I think what's really exciting is that we're going to be able to treat forms of cancer that weren't treatable today. If we cure cancer, yes, we will be out of business, but that's a good problem to have. So let me, let me so it p put it like this. It's like you have um, various classical music organs in different parts of the university that make a sound on their own and they could be pretty good. Piano can be pretty good. But then we come here and we try to put it all together as a symphony and try to, 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 to put to work. That's what the Cancer Center does, brings together different parts of the university, different science, uh, different uh, uh, scientific areas, and different groups, and we motivate them to work together to fight cancer. That's, that's what we do.